Okay, Acts chapter 7. As we get back to studying the book of Acts, it's been a little, uh, a little while, been a few weeks. Um, it's nice to be able to have a voice again to, to be able to speak. Um, but as we get back to Acts, we're going to get back to Acts chapter 7. And uh, I have to be honest, I, I, I thought about skipping past this text. We're going to be looking at uh, pretty much the whole chapter, uh, verses 1 through 53 of the book of Acts. And it's Stephen's answer <clears throat> to the question. Now remember, back in Acts 6, uh, they had grabbed up uh, on him and they had hauled him before the Sanhedrin. And they had uh, uh, instigated men to, uh, to lie and bear false witness against him and uh, accuse him of blasphemy, blaspheming God, Moses, the, the, uh, the law, and the temple. And uh, in, in Acts chapter 7, verse 1, <clears throat> the high priest said, Are these things so? And when we get into this section, it's Stephen's sermon. Now, um, what was the sermon about Sunday? At church. Anybody remember? At your church, what was the sermon about? Reformation. Reformation? The pastor's last day, so he was telling us how great we were. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> what was the sermon about Sunday? Kingdom, family, kingdom, people. Okay, good. Good. So we, we remember. <laughs> See, we do that, don't we? We sit under a sermon and we walk away. And, and, and what's the takeaway? What do we remember about this sermon? And uh, uh, Stephen's answer to that question is his sermon. Uh, and, and it's the longest recorded sermon in the book of Acts, which is actually a book of sermons. It, it, there's got a lot of sermons in the book of Acts. And it's his actually his last sermon because this Christ-centered, Christ-exalting uh, sermon got him killed. Um, now some, I, I was reading some, some commentaries and some had said that uh, his sermon was rather boring and, and because the sermon was so boring, that's why he got stoned. And, you know, some, some people said some things. Um, but this sermon is a little different. Um, than a lot of the sermons. But, you know, uh, the idea of apologetics. Apologetics is the study of the defense of the faith. We need to know what we believe, but we need to know why we believe what we believe. Amen? And we need to be able to explain that. We need to be able to, to, to tell people. Um, Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 3.15, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And Stephen was a great apologist. He, um, <clears throat> in chapter 6 and verse 10, as they were debating with him in the synagogues, it says that they were unable to withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And so, you know, we're not told the content of the debates in the synagogues, but make no mistake about it, he was sharing the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was talking about Jesus being the Messiah. He was talking about Jesus being the only way of salvation. And they were debating against him. And remember, we had, we had talked about this a couple of weeks ago. It's very possible that Saul of Tarsus was in there, was in the, in the synagogue in Cilicia. And and, and he was one of the ones that was debating Stephen. And so, you know, we can deduce from that that, that that very well may have been where Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul, uh, may have first heard the gospel from Stephen as they're debating Stephen. And, uh, but they couldn't, it, it does, whatever the content of the debates was about, Stephen won. Stephen won the debate. He was a great apologist and he was able to defend the gospel and, and share the gospel. And they couldn't say anything. They couldn't stand up against that. And so they uh, brought false charges against him and, and, and accused him falsely. 
And so he, they, they made up these false charges of blasphemy against him, and they seized him, and they hauled him before the Sanhedrin for trial. And his defense was based solidly on the Old Testament scripture, because Stephen knew what he believed, and he knew why he believed what he believed. And so in chapter 7 and verse 1, the high priest said, Are these things so? And so as chapter 7 opens, his trial actually begins. And the main part of the chapter consists of Stephen's defense against these false charges that were brought against him. And he stood accused of blaspheming God, blaspheming Moses, blaspheming uh, the law, and blaspheming the temple which were the most serious charges imaginable in this Jewish society. And so, uh, again, his, his defense is the longest recorded sermon in, in the book of Acts. And so, um, let's look at Stephen's uh, fourfold defense. Now, we're going to be looking at primarily almost the whole chapter, uh, verses 1 through 53. But we're going to break it down into, uh, into four sections. So his first defense was uh, against the charge uh, of uh, blaspheming God. So let's look at uh, verses 1 through 16. And the high priest said, Are these things so? And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. And he said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child." And God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them 400 years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God, and after that they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac, and he circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. But God was with him, and rescued him out of all of his afflictions, and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over his household. Now there came a famine throughout all of Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob, his father, and all his kindred, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died. He and our fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem, and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamar in Shechem. Doesn't sound like he answered that question, does he? he, he it, are these things so? Uh, his reply uh, doesn't appear to directly answer that question. One, uh, one author said this uh, about his defense. The defense of Stephen before the Sanhedrin is hardly a defense in the sense of an explanation or apology, calculated to win an acquittal. Rather, it is a proclamation of the Christian message in terms of the popular Judaism of the day and an indictment of the Jewish leaders for their failure to recognize Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah or to appreciate the salvation provided in him. And so as we get, as we work our way through this text, we're going to see that he begins nicely. He starts out nicely. And, and, and as he goes on, he gets into, he, he starts making some jabs and starts putting some things in there. And then he ends and he just hits him right between the eyes. And so Stephen uses a, a lengthy historical summation to make his case. His, his purpose was to show that Christ, 
um, which he preached was the perfect fulfillment of the Old Testament. And so he wove his way through the Old Testament, through the history of the nation of Israel. He traces the line of God's uh, sovereign will from Abraham through Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David, and Solomon um, to the Lord Jesus, which in verse 52, he calls him the righteous one. And so Stephen begins by uh, appealing to them as, as brothers and fathers, showing respect for and solidarity with them uh, as leaders of the Jewish people. And, and then he gets into, the, he, he calls God the God of glory. And uh, this title only appears here and in Psalm 29, verse 3. And so he, he weaves his way through the, the, the history of the nation, um, but uh, showing respect not only for them, but showing respect for God. Because remember, the accusation was that he was blaspheming God. And, and, and he talks about uh, our father Abraham, who was the father of, uh, of, of the faith and father of, God, uh, you know, of God's people. And uh, so in his opening line, he established his belief in the sovereignty uh, of, God's, uh, of the God of Abraham and acknowledged the fatherhood of, of Abraham over the nation of Israel. He was testifying that he was neither a blasphemer of God nor a traitor to his people. And, and from there, he followed the flow of salvation history, acknowledging God's sovereign control. And, and so he was defending against the accusation of blaspheming God. Secondly, he defends against the uh, accusation of blaspheming Moses. Look at verses 17 through 37. But as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt, until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight. And he was brought up for three months in, the father, in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, reconcile them saying, men, your brothers, why do you wrong each other? But the, man, but the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside and said, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this report, retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now when 40 years, old had, or when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. And as he drew near to look, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, take off your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I've surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both a ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. And so now he makes his defense against Moses by giving uh, the history of Moses. He talks about the time of promise. 
And the time of promise refers to uh, when God would fulfill his promise to Abraham. The promise that he would give the land to, uh, as a possession to his offspring after him. And, and now, uh, you know, by this time the patriarchs had died. The people of Israel had increased and multiplied. They were in Egypt at this time. A new Pharaoh uh, rose up. He did not know Joseph. And so the, the nation of Israel were now enslaved in Egypt and were there, as was predicted, for 400 years. And, and at this time, God raised up a deliverer. And notice the wording that he used. He, he raised up a deliverer. And, and again, this is a foreshadow of the deliverer. This is pointing towards Christ. And, and they rejected this deliverer. And, and Stephen now uh, summarizes the de details of Moses' life and makes a point of praising him, stating that he was beautiful in God's sight. And after summarizing the details of Moses' life, Stephen makes his point. Verse 35 says, This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? This man uh, uh, God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. And so, uh, he get, again, he starts out really nice. And he relates to them as, as brothers and fathers. And then he, he, he talks about Moses and, and in no way is a blasphemer of Moses. And so he makes his, his defense against that, but actually is beginning to now turn the tables. He's actually beginning to, to, to say, I'm not the blasphemer. I'm not the rejecter. You guys are. Your fathers were. And you guys are. And he'll, he'll end up saying that. Um, There's some parallels uh, between uh, the life of Moses and Jesus. You think about this. Moses, uh, according to you know, the scripture and, and the history, Moses humbled himself by leaving Pharaoh's palace. He chose not to be in Pharaoh's palace, but to go back and, and, and into his people. Jesus humbled himself by becoming a man. In Philippians chapter 2, the uh, Apostle Paul does a great job of talking about that. Moses was rejected at first. Jesus was, re was rejected when he came to his own in John chapter 1. Moses was a shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd, according to John chapter 10. Moses redeemed his people from uh, the bondage in Egypt. Jesus redeems mankind from bondage to sin. And so the history of Moses foreshadows the history of Christ, the, the Messiah. And so he makes his defense and points out that the people rejected Moses. That their fathers rejected Moses, that he wasn't a blasphemer, a rejecter of Moses, that they actually were and their fathers were. Next he goes to um, uh, defending the accusation of blaspheming the law. Look at verses 38 through 43. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to give to us. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside. And in their hearts they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol uh, and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices during the forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Moloch and the star of your god Rapham, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. And so now he talks about, uh, he goes to, uh, from the exodus into the Babylonian captivity. And he talks about the, the, the law. Um, and it's an easy transition from Moses to the law. Because Moses was the one that received the law and gave the law to the people. And people, uh, or, uh, Stephen points out that he was the one 
that received the living oracles and gave it to, to us, to our people. The living oracles were obviously the law. And Stephen affirms his belief in the law, declaring that God was the author of the law, that the, angels, uh, the angel was its mediator, and, and Moses was its recipient, and then he gave it to the people. And, uh, and that certainly was not blaspheming the law. It was certainly not blaspheming Moses. It certainly was not, was not blasphemy against the law. Uh, and, and they knew it. I mean, what could they say? Just like as he was debating uh, with them in the synagogues, they couldn't withstand the wisdom. What could they say against that? He was speaking truth. And so Stephen reminds them uh, that their fathers refused to obey uh, Moses and thrust him aside and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. And so again, he's, he's flipping, he's changing, he's turning the tables and, and, and then kind of putting them on the stand. He's on the stand, the stand, he's on the defense, but he's changing it around and putting them on the stand. And he goes on to quote Amos chapter, uh, chapter 5 to support his, his point. Uh, the Babylonian captivity, uh, which God led them into, which God brought upon them because of their uh, disobedience. And then finally in verses 44 through 53, he defends against blaspheming the, the temple. Um, let's look at uh, verses 44 and following. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he spoke to Moses, um, directed him to make it. He who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers, in turn, brought it in with uh, Joshua when they disposed the nations that God drove out before their fathers. It was... It, so it was until the days of David, who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? Let's stop right there for just a minute. And, and so he defends uh, this, this accusation against blaspheming the temple by making the case that God is not com confined to a place. That he does not, uh, he's not confined. They, they, they were worshiping the temple more than they were worshiping the God of the temple. And so he makes this, this defense, he makes his case and he points out that God directly uh, directed Moses to make the tent of witness. And, and Israel had this constant symbol of God's holy presence. And yet they persisted into falling into idolatry. Stephen points, out to, the, or points to the apostasy and the rejection of the representatives, the, the apostles, and how they rejected and killed the, apostle, or the, the, the prophets that God had sent. And so throughout his speech, think about this, as he's turning the tables, the tension had to have been building. It started out really nice, and they're listening, and, and, and they, uh, you know, they prided themselves on knowing the, 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 the history of the nation of Israel. And so you know, they're listening, and then, and then he begins to point out that the fathers were the ones that rejected. Their fathers were the ones that, uh, that were blaspheming. They're, they're the ones that are guilty, not him. And, and then he points out um, that now he turns and just actually just points the finger right at them. Look at verses 51 through 53. Now he was doing well. He was doing really good. Now remember, he's, he's making his defense and he's got their ear and he's, he's got them listening and they're, they're, they're getting a little tense now. But then he just lays it all out. Notice what he says in verses 51 through 53. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. 
you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. And so it's, you know, the wait is over. He just, he just lays it all out there and he hits them right between the eyes. And he said, you stiff-necked people. He didn't pull any punches. He draws his speech to a, a stinging conclusion and, and points the finger and speaks the truth. He says, as your fathers killed the prophets, so too you have killed the Messiah. Since the law pointed to Christ, they were without excuse. Jesus said in John 5, 46, he said, if you believed in Moses, you would believe in me, for he wrote of me. And so he made this stinging accusation, the truth, that they were the ones that were actually re rejecting. They were the ones that killed the Messiah. Their fathers had murdered uh, God's prophets. They had murdered God's son, the righteous one. And, and so he made his defense in this long, drawn out, um, somewhat dry sermon. But this is one of the greatest sermons ever preached. Stinging truth. And Stephen not only made his defense, but turned the tables and put them on trial and proved that they were the ones that were guilty. And this long, amazing sermon through the history of the nation of Israel ended in Stephen's death. So we'll talk about that next week, that Stephen became the first martyr uh, the first Christian martyr. He made his defense. You think about this. They should have heard it with their hearts and repented. But they did not. They were angered. They held their ears. And they ran, charged at him. And they stoned him. And so we'll talk about that next week. Let's pray. Father, once again, we just uh, thank you for the truth of your word. Help us, Lord, that, uh, that as we read, as we study, as we hear, God, that we will hear with the ears of our hearts. That we will see, God, the, the truth of your word. And Lord, help us to live accordingly. And God will be sure to give you the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.